This week on Life and Faith. There's a bit of health in every family. Sometimes it doesn't look like it, but learning to see when I sit with families who are really chaotic on the surface, there are things they're doing that are benefiting the growth and resilience of its members. It's not all dysfunction. If we're doing work right, it's a part of life. There's an opportunity to reconnect with spirituality through parenthood. I don't think that there's that many true atheists out there, really. We certainly knew that it was going to lead to war. Welcome to Life and Faith from CPX. I'm Simon Smart. It's good to be back with you after a couple of weeks break. And we're planning some fun and exciting episodes to take us up to Christmas. I can't believe I'm saying that. Anyway, Natasha Moore is here. Hey, Simon. Uh, Yeah, 2021 has been quite the year. Uh, And, you know, maybe at this point in 2021, this is really an optimal time given the ongoing lockdowns that many of us have experienced in the last few months to think about the topic of today's episode. We are looking at families and mental health. Everyone comfy? (laughs) Good. Now, don't touch any of those buttons in front of you for a very important reason, i.e., you are wired into the rest of your family. You have the ability to shock them, and they have the ability to shock... Ah! Why you? Oh, oh, not yet. (laughs) You see, this is what is known as aversion therapy. When someone hurts you emotionally, you will hurt them physically, and gradually you will learn not to hurt each other at all. And won't that be wonderful, Homer? Oh, yes, Doctor. Bart, how could you shock your little sister? My finger slipped. Ah! So did mine. Bart, Lisa, stop that. No, no, no. No, No, wait a minute. Wait, wait. Now that is, of course, the classic dysfunctional TV family, The Simpsons. Now, they may be cartoons, even caricatures, but part of the reason the show is so long-running is the recognition of seeing how people assume different roles within a family and what happens as they either conform to type or try to break free of those assigned roles. How would you describe your role, Simon, in your family of origin? (laughs) Well, I'm the youngest of three boys, so of course I had it the toughest. toughest spot, that spot <laughs> I was going to say you the... were the most precious, no? <laughs> well, maybe the most spoiled. I mean, the, the, um, it's actually interesting because when I thought about this, my eldest brother was very responsible from a very young age and uh, you know, continued that. And so I sort of slipped easily into the very irresponsible role. <laughs> but I think you eventually grow out of that, right? <laughs> Maybe, maybe not. (laughs) I'm middle child. My older sister is still definitely the most responsible. Uh Um, And what were you? So, what was your kind of role then? I guess these things are complex, right? But Mm -hmm. I think my role within my family is kind of the vague, slightly hopeless one. (laughs) Hopefully, less hopeless than I used to be. But you know, was it because you're just disengaged and head in a book, or what? What? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I'm the Bookworm, the non-practical one, the one that doesn't really know what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Mm. How did that go for you? Well, I mean, it was a lot of fun. I, <laughs> <laughs> I hope that I've grown out of it a bit. But, you know, the, the thing that you are growing up, you kind of always are that to your family, even if you change a lot as an adult. Yes, that's very interesting to me because I think that's true. Even though you only live with your family maybe for 17 years in my case, but you have these sort of assigned positions and expectations perhaps all the way through into adulthood. So the the idea that our identity and our well-being is less about who we are as individuals functioning in isolation and more about the webs of relationships we're embedded in. There's a, there's a particular school of thought that explores this. It's called Bowen Family Systems Theory. Some people might be very familiar with this approach. For others, it might be a new concept. Someone who's done a lot to bring Bowen theory to a wider audience is Dr. Jenny Brown. She's the founder of the Family Systems Institute and the author of a number of books, including Growing Yourself Up and Confident Parenting. She's also, the week that we're publishing this episode, she's been delivering the annual New College Lectures in Sydney on the theme of nurture. 
Yeah, Jenny says that our important relationships are a kind of laboratory in which we grow and mature, or, or don't. And in this conversation, Natasha and I speak with her about family systems theory, starting with why it became such a strong focus for her. I was always interested in the context of human problems and challenges in the environment, not just what's going on inside the individual. I started studying law, but moved across to studying social studies and sociology, and then the track down social work, which brought me into family therapy in the early 80s. And as I worked with families, I just always thought that the context of the family was so vital to the emotional well-being of every individual. And I could talk about my own family experience. That's clearly part of what shapes that. But I think my interest in sociology back at school, my favourite subject was human geography. So there's a bit of a theme and a trend there. But I came across a theory called Bowen Family Systems Theory when I lived and studied in New York in the early 90s. And it just opened up my own understanding of my client families and my own family and the patterns in families in a way I just hadn't been able to clarify with other training I'd done. Can I ask you about your own family, Jenny, or do you prefer not to talk about that? Sure, no. One of the distinctives about Bowen family systems theory is it isn't about people who have mental illness and people who don't. It's about all of us humans struggling with very similar issues. Some families and individuals develop symptoms. In fact, most families do at various points in time with enough stress accumulating. So it's really easy in this field to talk about my own family. There's not really this distinction between the expert who's got her life together and the client who's seeking help. Um, So very briefly, my own family I grew up in, I'm one of five siblings, number two, four girls, and then a boy right at the end. And even that is really interesting from a family systems perspective being a family of dominant females and at the baby who's a boy. And like many families, Natasha, there were great strengths and there were times of real vulnerability. We had some adversities along the way, house burning down. Wow. Mother died of breast cancer quite young. So these, I think that can add to your hearing why I'm interested in context seeing how each family member coped differently with those stress points in family life has been really valuable to me. Mm. So a little bit about my family. Yeah. Every family has a big story of course. to tell. And a complex one because people are complex and there are multiple people. In Indeed. Family. <laughs> Indeed. Can I ask you about one of your books? A very popular book is called Growing Yourself Up. Um, I'm interested in how much we talk now about adulting and growing up as this kind of increasingly mysterious and unattainable thing. Mm -hmm. Could you say something about what's so hard about growing up or being a grown up? And like, are we worse at it than we used to be? Or we just talk about it more? Great question. I think I read that the word adulting was one of the most popular new words in about 2018 amongst young people. Not, not something I use myself, but it's out there. So what is this interest in adulting? And why did I write a book called Growing Yourself Up? Is there a problem with maturity in society? And I do want to emphasize that I don't like the title of my book without the subtitle. So it's Growing Yourself Up. And the subtitle is really important to me. It's how to bring your best to all of life's relationships. So what's distinct about the message I'm wanting to convey and help people understand is that we grow our resilience and our responsibility and our coping mechanisms within the laboratory of our important relationships, even the difficult relationships. 
that if we avoid difficulty, if we avoid learning to hold our boundaries, manage our reactivity, our emotions getting stirred up, if we can do that in our original family, then we can do it anywhere. Uh, That's the real place of a good workout for growing the capacity to be a flourishing human in the world. And I do think, I I mean, there's quite a lot of writing out there over recent times about, you know, the coddling of the American mind or other books similarly questioning particularly the current college age, university age generation that learning to be a responsible adult has been an issue and that that's not a burden or a blame to put on one generation. That's something to look at in the whole spectrum of the life cycle. How have we got to this place? Gosh, everything you're talking about could lead us into other directions here, but something you mentioned there that I think is really important and, and you're big on this and that is people taking responsibility for themselves and their actions not just blaming others is this part of being an adult too yes it's not a very attractive idea is it Simon <laughs> well, learning not, not to... immediately, no, <laughs> no, no it's not I think it's why Bowen family systems theory while it's embedded in really solid research It hasn't ever become a mainstream approach in the mental health world. It's not an easy sell Mm. to work on being responsible for self. It's a much easier sell out there to talk about toxic parents, people who've damaged you, how to be healed from all of that in the confines of an artificial therapy relationship. So being responsible for self is an important emphasis in becoming more robust emotionally and psychologically. A a key idea in Bowen theory is being a more autonomous self, not a rugged individual, but being able to manage our own emotional reactions and not being dependent on others to calm us down solve our problems for us, think for us, do for us, direct us. So learning to do more of that from within and everyone's starting from a different level of their maturity. So we've all been dealt a different hand of maturity cards, but that's the idea of growing a more responsible self. But it needs to have a lot of compassion for self and the people we've grown up with, the challenges that they face. It's not this kind of telling people to grow up and get over their past. It's a compassionate, thoughtful reinvestigation of the past. Yes, and and as you say, some people have different cards when it comes to maturity levels or capacity, but Mm -hmm. also very real different cards when it comes to the sort of environment they've been given to grow up. And I suppose there's a, there needs to be a lot of space to allow for that. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Now, I'm very interested in the roles people play in a family. Um, now, I'm the youngest of three, Jenny. What would be the kind of profile that would typically be one that I would have in a family? What role might I play? <laughs> if, we can, if we can play that game for a moment. Well, everyone loves formulas. <laughs> okay. uh, I'll, I'll take part of your invitation to discuss that. Yeah. But um, we love easy formulas and categories and typologies. And Bowen theory doesn't offer that because it's so complex. For example, if you're the youngest of three and your parents had a different sibling position, then the role that you occupy is going to be different to if they were also youngest or an older. So there are so many different factors that go into it. But in general, the eldest or the youngest or a child who's born at a high stress point in the family is likely to be most focused on by parents, either focused on and lent on to be helpful or focused on and lent on in worrying about them. Mm, And that's a key to understanding sibling variation and how people grow up 
to have different ways of operating in relationship. So is it, I guess I, you know, I could, now that I have my therapist sitting here, we could, you know, I'm going to tell you all about my role in the family. No, I'm not. But uh, um, is it therefore a part of becoming a responsible person is to have a sense of at least an awareness mm-hmm. of who I am and maybe the sorts of roles I played? And I'm interested in what happens if I stop playing that role. So let me give an example. If you had a role of being a confidant to one of your parents, and so you tend in your adult life to be a helper, a listening ear, taking a person's side, helping them feel better about their challenges in life, all good things on one level. But if you discover that that role is hindering another person growing their own responsibility, learning to be a stand on their own two feet more, and you start to change that either with members of the family or in your current family of creation or in your workplace or your church community or wherever, whenever we change a posture that people have gotten used to in a relationship, we're going to get this huge change back reaction. It's not going to be welcomed. That's one of the predictable parts of this family systems idea. So it takes courage to change and a belief that changing is better in the big picture for self and for others. So Jenny, can you give us kind of, can you sketch a picture of what this looks like, how it plays out? What are some roles that people play and then what happens when they Mm -hmm. stop playing them or try to? Well, Bowen theory from research identified that there are some predictable patterns and postures, and you could call them roles, that we get into in relationships to help a system, a family, to cope with stress and change. And in simple form, those roles are being over-responsible or under-responsible and uh, being the one who takes the lead quickly and feels secure when they're in charge and then under responsible. They feel secure when people are looking after them, helping them, propping them up. And these are roles that emerge in the family. Other roles and patterns in the family are the one who is the anxiety dampener in the family, who comes in to calm other people, the one who escalates anxiety in the family, the canary in the mine shaft role. Um, is in every family. And these are just different pattern reactions to stress in a family that always happen. Distancing is another posture and a role, a person who can distance to their work or emotionally just be silent in the family and other people who are pursuers always trying to bring people in, pursue people for closeness. So I could go on, Natasha, but I wonder if mm. if you can recognise any of those ones. It's a little bit different to the customary description of roles that is more behavioural theory rather than a theory about emotional sensitivities and how we unconsciously, out of our awareness, adjust ourselves according to where the tension is in our relationships. So I'm wondering what it looks like for a family to function well and to be healthy, like thinking about, is it Tolstoy's saying about how all happy families are the same and all unhappy families are, you know, interesting in their own way, unhappy in their own way. But is that true? There are lots of ways of being a healthy, functional family or you think it it usually looks a particular way? I wouldn't divide families into healthy or unhealthy. We all sit on a continuum and there's a bit of health in every family. There truly is. Sometimes it doesn't look like it, but learning to see when I sit with families who are really chaotic on the surface, there are things they're doing that are benefiting the growth and resilience of its members. It's not all dysfunction. We've all got a bit of dysfunction in our families as well. (laughs) But it's a great question to consider what does a healthier family look like? And by healthy, I would say where all members of the family can flourish, not just some, because that's a key issue in family systems, that the 
over functioners can flourish at the expense of the people who are overhelped or over criticized or over monitored. So you want a family where everyone is given breathing space to develop their psychological autonomy. In this theory, it's called to develop their self in connection, their differentiation in the family. So families that are not too intense, lowering intensity is a key factor to people being able to grow and flourish and develop more of their unique individual selves that doesn't come at the expense of meaningful connection with others. This is Life and Faith, and Dr. Jenny Brown is talking Natasha and I through what family systems theory is and how it looks in real life relationships. I'll give two brief examples, one de-identified and one a recent conference presentation that is more a public domain presentation that I think illustrates it. I'll do it briefly. The first is thinking about a client, and there are many that are in this category, who have come to see me after years of individual psychotherapy for past wounds, who've decided that their parents are narcissistic or toxic or whatever the label is and have gotten some encouragement from having a therapist affirm that but they've just gotten stuck and we're working to map out an understanding of what shaped their parents not to minimize the damage done by neglectful or critical or even abusive parenting but also helping them to see that their parents' story came out of the generations of what went before. And people get curious about that. They can slowly come out of feeling like a victim and they can learn to be in the presence of their parents without reverting to being that 13-year-old immediately, to learn to be who they are now, not go back into the emotional dependent state they were in before. The real work is in their relationships outside of the counselling room, learning to build their emotional muscles by becoming less reactive, becoming better observers of themselves, learning about their sensitivities and how they can manage them better. And I would just add in here that it's not just Bowen theory, but the dominant research on mental health at the moment is underlying the importance of emotion regulation for resilience in the world. So an approach that helps people work on that is critical. Well, especially now, I can imagine that all of our sort of emotions are mm-hmm. kind of at an intensified rate, if you like. Yes. Um, right now. So tell us about the other one, the conference. Uh, briefly, so we had we did had a conference on trauma broadening the lens at the Family Systems Institute, looking at the big picture of trauma recovery. Fine speakers at the conference, but one was Louise Campbell, an Indigenous woman who was one of the stolen generation, and the trauma of her experience, sustained trauma of being removed with six siblings, age six, not seeing her family again for 20 years, going in and out of institutions, in foster homes, some that were abusive. And here is this woman who has a flourishing life. How could that be? Yeah. And, and just hearing some of the key factors that have gone into that, and there are many, Her education has been a protective factor, but very important is finding her biological family again, dealing with the challenges of reunion, which are not happy ending stories. They're very difficult, but dealing with them, having an aunt who really helped her reconnect with her mother again, her father and her siblings, and how important that reconnection with family, with community, with culture has been. So much more important to recovery than any mental health treatment approach. You told us a little about your family 
journey and the challenges that your family of origin have faced. Is there anything you can tell us about how understanding that family system has helped your family to grow and flourish? If I look at key moments of adversity, such as when my mother died of breast cancer, when we were moving from adolescence into adulthood as a family, just seeing how strong the patterns of distance and avoidance are in my family as a way of coping and how much that's deep within me. I can see that in current COVID lockdown, my tendency to distance is a happy place for me and I need to work at reversing that constantly through my life to stay meaningfully engaged with people. And the other piece of it is just how much I found security in being my mother's helper and confidant and triangles, we weren't even, that's another whole podcast, but I was in an alliance with my mother where she didn't put my father down, but she would talk about her worries for my father and my siblings. So I learned to feel secure in being a helper. Probably gives you some idea as to why I ran away from studying arts law into a helping profession. I was primed for it. So it might be surprising to hear, but I've spent years working to not be an overhelper, staying in my profession, but learning to be side by side with the people I'm assisting so they can discover their own resources Mm. and not be dependent on me. And that's not easy for me. I love feeling the security and the meaning that you can get from people appreciating your help, but I've actually realised that's not maturity at all. That's my immaturity at work. It's interesting how you can take something that might be a, a difficulty, perhaps even a problem earlier, and sort of move it into something positive as you grow, Mm. as you grow up. Can I ask you, Jenny, to talk a bit about how this theory, this perspective fits into your worldview as a Christian, Mm -hmm. particularly as it comes to understanding who we are as human beings, you know, what are the things that are wrong with us? How do we flourish? Uh, How do we relate? How are we as individuals versus community? Those sorts of things. Yeah. I thought a lot about this as a Christian Um, experiencing the grace of God in my life and seeing how important that is to change, that I never would want a secular theory to be a replacement for that incredible resource to discovering um, an abundant life as a human in the world in understanding our creator God. So that's been important to me to critique the theories that I come across in my professional life. But where family systems theory sits really well for me is just how relational the Christian life is to appreciate that every part of a system of relationships has an important role to be honoured, however small that might be, and that really fits for me. It also fits my understanding of how anxious this world is. I see and I understand through a biblical lens just that this is a broken world, that anxiety and stress is part of the brokenness. Now, the piece that is missing from any secular theory is the issue of sin and rebellion and, you know, just going our own way rather than respecting and honouring a creator God. But I do think that Bowen theory as an astute observer of human nature recognizes wrongdoing in the world, which is the essence of over self-focus, doing what makes us comfortable without considering the impact on our neighbor. So for me, it gets into a really core part of loving my neighbor as myself. What about um, the Christian idea of how we change which you know the bible would say that we need a lot of help with that that we can't kind of fix ourselves how does that fit with you know this vision of well figuring out what your family systems are what you're doing doing that better how do you fit those things together another great question natasha Uh, it is always worth asking any theory 
How does it understand the nature of the problem being treated? And therefore, what is the process of change? And in family systems theory, the process of change is working on becoming a better observer of self, how we're affecting other people and how they're impacting us and to be able to change our part in that. From a Christian perspective, the wonderful piece to just add to that, because I think humans can change a good deal through their own efforts and self-awareness. But as a Christian, this is the one relationship, my relationship with Jesus is where responsible dependency <laughs> I'm responsible for how I respond in dependence to a, a good shepherd who leads me and guides me and comforts me. And that is such a different pathway to change than any psychological theory. And I do think it's important to just appreciate that there is a supernatural element to people changing and flourishing that psychology and psychological theory can't give. So Jenny, what's been the most satisfying aspect of this career that you have taken on? Where do I begin? It has been satisfying and I think predominantly, Simon, because it's been useful to me in my own important relationships as well as seeing it being useful to people that come to a clinical practice or come to a training institute to learn how to help people in a more constructive way. So it's that balance of helping me to grow up as well as assisting others. And I say to people that I supervise in the field, we get this wonderful bonus working in this field that we sit with people who are working their way through challenges and we ask questions and we give some reflective feedback and then we stop and can say to ourselves, hey, wait a minute, Jenny, are you applying that to your own life? <laughs> so you've got this regular checkup on are you being responsible? Jenny Brown in your own life. And that's humbling and helpful. And I really value that. This has been Life and Faith from CPX with me, Simon Smart and Natasha Moore. Our thanks to Dr. Jenny Brown for this conversation about mental health and well-being in the context of the relationship webs that we're all part of. If you want to go deeper on this, Jenny's book, Growing Yourself Up, How to Bring Your Best to All of Life's Relationships, comes highly recommended. Her new college lectures on nurture will be available to listen to online. And her most recent undertaking is The Parent Hope Project. We'll have links to those and to her other books in the show notes. If this episode has brought things up for you that are difficult, we really encourage you to seek help. Now, one way of doing that is to call Lifeline on 13 11 14. If there's someone you know who you think would appreciate this episode, please do send it on to them. And leave us a rating or review. We like to see these, but importantly, it helps other people find out about life and faith. Next week. My parents never had to worry about catching me out in anything because if I did something wrong, the clock was ticking and I would confess all. And that really did reflect my idea of God as well. Not just that I was afraid that God was looking over my shoulder and wanted to punish me. It was more, you want to live with clear conscience. 